come you're watching to the point what impact will demonetization have on economic activity and GDP growth has it been thoughtfully or unthinkingly implemented and most importantly of all can it effectively tackle black money as well as counterfeit currency those are the three key issues I should raise today with the former deputy chairman of the planning commission Montek Singh Aluwalia. Mr. Aluwalia I'm going to conduct this interview in what many would consider a sort of back to front way. I'm going to begin by asking you about the impact demonetization can have on GDP growth and economic activity. Then I'll ask you whether it's been implemented thoughtfully or unthinkingly. And finally, I'll come to what is the raison d'etre. Can it effectively tackle black money and counterfeit currency? Now, as you know, India is a country where 90% of all transactions happen in cash. And secondly, 85% of workers are paid in cash. In that sort of economic circumstance, what do you think will be the impact on economic activity if 86% of all currency is suddenly removed in one fell swoop? Well, there's no question that it's a very big shock. I mean, very few cases have you seen 86% of the currency nullified. And that will lead to a cash crunch. And that will lead, apart from the inconvenience, you know, there's been a lot of television coverage, and those are real issues, long lines, and government has been very apologetic that, yes, there have to be long, long lines. And even people have been actually quite understanding because they have said, we don't mind this short-term pain if there's gain. But the fact is that it's not just the inconvenience, it's the uh, scarcity of cash, which is going to disrupt business and livelihoods in the informal sector, which is a large part of the economy. And that will really shrink uh, economic activity for some time. It depends on how long it lasts. Let's focus for a moment on the informal sector, which is sometimes called the unorganized sector. It represents 45% of GDP. Mm -hmm. It accounts for 80% of all jobs. Now, most enterprises in the informal sector actually get their money from non-banking in financial institutions, sometimes even from money lenders and hundis, all of whom at the moment are starved of cash. So what will be the impact on this sector? Well, I've not done an estimation, but we must be clear about one thing. There will be an impact, and a lot of it depends on how long this shock continues. I mean, for example, I see in estimates, one of them done by my former colleague, Saumitra Chowdhury, who sort of asked the question, you know, how long would it take, in principle, to replace the currency notes that have effectively been withdrawn. Now he says that it might take up to May the 17th, given the limitations of the printing presses. I think that you don't need to replace all of it. I mean, some of it is probably dead stock. But whichever way you look at it, it will take up to end of March. Now that's a very long period for this sector to be bearing a shock. Now some people have made estimates, but they vary. I mean, some people are saying, the loss of GDP growth may be as much as three percentage points. Others say maybe one percentage point. It's quite possible that the one percentage point may be closer to the mark, but I've not myself done these exercises. Let me quote to you what YV Reddy, the former governor of the RBI, has said. He says about 30 percent of the working capital of small and medium businesses comes from the black segment of the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, if that black segment is effectively paralyzed, and what will be the impact on small and medium enterprises? No, I think, uh, I don't know what he means by the black segment. I suppose he means black unorganized. Money. You know, I think we need to make a distinction between black income and black wealth. Okay? The two are quite different. And the truth of the matter is that a lot of black income is being spent on activities which are being serviced by perfectly legal operations. That will so be affected. Link, it will be definitely affected. I mean, when one thinks of, let's say, a speculative high-rise apartment owned by people who generate black money being put to a stop, uh, that makes people feel good. But this activity is going to lead to wages not being paid, construction material not being ordered. That leads to a disruption in an otherwise normal part of the year. Two are really interlinked. In fact, that leads me to the question about what will be the impact on what's called casual daily wage labor. I'm talking about both urban and rural casual daily wage labor, which by some estimate could be as much as 30% of the working. Now, these are people who work day to day and depend upon their daily income to actually live. If they don't earn, they don't eat. But if construction sites stop, if other places where daily wage labor is employed starts not taking them on, 
what sort of plight do they face? No, no, there's, I mean, when, I don't know what the government's uh, assessment is. I mean, they, they have their own technical experts, the RBI. They the haven't Finance made Ministry. it public if they have an assessment. Yes. From and their side, their silence. It would be useful to know when they took this decision, uh, what was their own assumption about what would be the economic disruption. Because, you know, in this sense, I mean, the image of a surgical strike gives the impression that you're targeting where the problem is. That's why the Supreme Court called it not a surgical strike, but carpet bombing. Because everyone, everyone is, affected. is affected. I Indiscriminately. think that's the truth, that everyone is affected. I'm assuming that the uh, government must have been advised by experts as to what would happen. And I don't know what their, what their assumption was. Neither do you, nor do I, and the government hasn't shared it with anyone, mm -hmm. so we just can't speculate. But can I, on this particular set of subjects, put this to you? Would you say that the unorganized or informal sector, and perhaps within that casual daily wage labor, would be amongst the most adversely affected because they are the least protected? Yes, not just the least protected in the sense that when they're affected, they don't have very much to fall back on, but because the cash on which their business depends is where the greatest scarcity has been introduced. The real question, by the way, they, can, they probably have informal credit arrangements, but you know, they pay very, very high interest rates for this informal credit. So you know, if it takes three days, four days, one week, maybe it's okay. But if it's going to take six months, then I think they are in trouble. And Deep this trouble. is underlined by the fact that the informal sector accounts for 45% of the economy and up to 80% of jobs. So you're talking about, you know, virtually half the economy and actually four-fifths of jobs. I think, you know, this is where the, what you need to look at is, what is the government's assumption on the impact on GDP growth? Because the other side of GDP growth is employment. So, uh, and I let, mean, me, let me answer you know, that. One other thing. The closest if the, that we if have to the government's growth, assumption on GDP growth is Pan Arvind Panagre is saying that he's still reasonably confident we'll come in close to 8%. Well, uh, I mean, I'm delighted if we come close, but this is something we need, we need to know. I mean, I saw in the newspapers, uh, one of the members of Niti Aayog, that's Bibek de Broy, say that the impact on the informal sector will be only 0.1%, okay? Which uh, many would say is hard to believe. I would agree with that view, it's hard to believe. Other people, I mean, if you look at the uh, let, analysts... Let, 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 let's leave the impact on GDP growth for a moment. Let me come back to another sector. One sector that I've discussed with you is the impact on the informal, unorganized sector, and with that we've talked specifically about casual labor. Let's come to agriculture, because demonetization is happening as farmers are getting ready, or perhaps are even already underway, with the rabi crop sowing. Now, until yesterday, when the government gave farmers permission to use the old 500 rupee notes to buy seeds, they didn't have the money to buy seeds. But they still don't have the money to pay for agricultural labor. And this is a critical point for them when labor is absolutely essential. No, no. Uh, so what is your assessment of the possible impact, A, on the rabi crop, and beyond that, on agricultural growth this year? You know, on the seeds issue, uh, I saw in the newspapers that they've been allowed to use 500 rupee notes if they're buying seeds from the public sector outlets. They're not allowed to use those notes if they're buying from the private sector. Outlet. Absolutely. And in the whole vegetable area, more and more farmers are buying from the private sector. So this you doesn't have the help. same problem in hospitals. So this doesn't help very much. This doesn't help them. In hospitals, for example, you know, 80% of people who take resort to hospitalization go to private hospitals. I mean, that's an indication of how our public hospitals and are not private functioning. hospitals are not allowed, not allowed to get old notes. So, I, this is multiplied over and but, over. But come back to agriculture, therefore, if the problem with buying seeds is actually largely unmitigated, as you point out, and the problem with hiring labor continues because you can't pay them with the old notes, what is the impact on agriculture? Because we were expecting agricultural growth after the monsoon to actually go up fairly sharply. Are we going to see that failing to happen? Well, it will, my, from all I can say is that it will not be as good as we thought. We have to ask the Ministry of Agriculture what their assessment is. But by the way, I think it was a very good move to relax the 500 constraint, 500 rupee note constraint for seeds. I think they should relax it more. I mean, cooperative banks is the other big area. I'll come to that in a moment, but even that relaxation of the 500 rupee note for seeds happened 
12 to 13 days after demonetization and initially the Indian Express reported that when the Agriculture Ministry asked the Finance Ministry for the relaxation, the Finance Ministry's first response was to say no. It's on a second appeal that they've changed their mind, but the first time they said no, so they weren't willing to do it the first time around. Well, I, I have no idea. I mean, I only read the newspaper. Now, another thing that know. comes up when we're talking about agriculture, the Economic Times points out that fruits, vegetables, dairy, and other horticulture amounts to 65% of farming by value. Now, these are all perishable commodities. Mm -hmm. If because of the cash crunch, farmers can't get their products to markets, or traders and mundis haven't got the cash to be able to buy them, presumably all of this is going to go waste, or large quantities of food will go waste. Well, waste and therefore they'll get less money for it and, you know, the other side of the coin is transport. I mean, transporters who transport these things also operate on a cash basis. So you've got a disruption in that part of the supply chain also. So just as there could be an adverse impact, and depending upon how long it lasts, it could be a sizable adverse impact mm. on the unorganized informal sector. Similarly, depending upon how long it lasts, there could be a fairly adverse impact on agriculture as well. Probably, yes. Probably, yes. Let's then come to the issue you were raising, and I stopped you, but I'll bring it up now. The impact on GDP growth. Several agencies have put out predictions. Some, like you quoted from Bipek Debro, is as small as 0.2%. Others say it will be somewhere between half and 1%. But AMBIT has actually said that GDP growth for the second half of this year will be just 0.5%. And overall growth for the year will have halved from the estimated 7.1, 7.2 or whatever down to just 3.5. Now, you've been Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission. You know how to respond to these sort of predictions. How do you respond to this particular one? Unfortunately, I don't have to respond. It's for the government to respond. But if you ask me, uh, the assessment that uh, 3.5, I would say, is a bit low. Uh, the growth rate is going to be adversely affected, no question. Somewhere between 1 and 2 percent. The as worst, much as 2 percent? It could be. Uh, the more interesting thing is what happens to employment. Because the adverse impact is going to be in the most employment-intensive part of GDP. So the impact on employment proportionally will be more than the loss on GDP. That, that, will, that will affect consumption, that, that will affect have demand, downstream, production, downstream. and it will be a ripple yes. effect. It will have a ripple. And we haven't talked about the real estate sector. I mean, that is the other sector, quite frankly, which is affected and will be affected. Now, one difference. I mean, the real estate sector had got distorted by an excessive dependence on black money. No question about that. That will clean up. That will clean up. That rebalancing is a good idea, but it will happen very suddenly. And the downstream effect of that is on construction labor. And that will hit casual labor most of all because it employs vast numbers of casual labor paid on a daily basis who now could either not be taken on or laid off. Yep. They won't earn, they won't eat, they won't spend, and that will affect demand and production again. That's true. So. Would you then, leaving aside predictions about impact on GDP growth, agree with your former colleague in the Planning Commission, Smitra Chaudhary, who said in the Economic Times, demonetization, whatever its motives, will exact a sizable and inescapable cost on the economy. Sizable and inescapable. No, no, look, it has to, because if you could instantly replace 86% of the currency by value, when I say instantly, in three days, four days, five days, then you could say things will settle down. Saumitra says that you can't do it until next May. I'm saying that maybe you don't need to replace all of it, but you do need to replace, I've made some calculation, that if you want to replace three-fourths of the 500 rupee notes and only about half of the value of the 1,000 rupee notes, it's still going to take you till the end of March. Now, that's a very long period for a credit shock to the informal sector, which actually doesn't have alternatives. Which means that if it lasts up till May, the pain, the impact on the economy will be, as Shomitra Chaudhary puts it, A, sizable, B, inescapable. But secondly, it actually will affect people's outlook as well. Because when the economy suffers, people suffer, and that affects people's outlook. Yes, that's generally true. I mean, I think most people think that any sizable shock you don't recover from it instantly. So once you've estimated the sizable shock, uh, you would be a little optimistic if you assume that somehow next year 
uh, everything will go back to normal. You won't bounce back the at once. The recovery is going to be slow. So the impact would last not for just this year, there could be an impact next year as well. Unless you do something to offset by jacking up other expenses. For example, if the government is in a position to hugely increase investment in infrastructure, road development, this, that, and the other, to offset the loss of construction labor um, employment, then, I mean, there'd be some offsetting. But that is to be seen. That we have to see. Let's then come, Mr. Aduwalia, to the second issue I want to raise with you, whether demonetization has been implemented thoughtfully or unthinkingly. First, when the government withdraws in one fell soup 86% of all currency, should it not have ensured that they had a far greater quantity of the new 2000 and the new 500 rupee notes, both printed and ready to distribute? And secondly, at the same time, should they not have also infused in far greater quantities of the 100 rupee note into the economy? Shouldn't both of those things have been done? Well, there's no question that um, I don't know why they were not done. And I don't know whether they were in a position to do it. But certainly when you withdraw a huge stock and you intend to replace it, you should have as much of that stock available as you can. And the fact that they are so slow in replacing it suggests they don't have enough ready. That would seem so, yeah. Now, it's clear that the new 500 rupee note and the new 2000 rupee note, in fact, only started being printed after the 4th of September. That's because they have Urujit Patel's signature and he only took over as governor after the 4th of September. Now, as Sumitra Chaudhary has revealed, and you were quoting him a moment ago, Indian mints, even if they work 24-7, cannot produce more than 300 crore pieces of currency a month. Mm -hmm. Yet the government has removed over 2,300 crore pieces of currency. This means that on the 8th of November, when demonetization happened, just about 26% of the notes that were about to be eliminated were actually ready and prepared. Doesn't that to you suggest a fairly poor level of preparedness? Well, I don't have, I mean, ideally one would like to get some authoritative statement uh, from the finance ministry. But if what you're saying is correct, uh, in that there wasn't uh, adequate preparation, uh, yes, uh, it has led to unnecessary disruption. Uh, had more, had a bigger stock been available, been placed around the country, etc., uh, there would have been less disruption. There's no question about that. Let's look at the second aspect of the implementation. Shouldn't the government have ensured that the new 500 and the new 2000 rupee notes were the same size, weight, and thickness as the old 500 and 1000? Because that would have meant there was no need to recalibrate the ATMs. The new notes could have taken the place of the old. And after all, in America, Every single dollar note from the hundred to the one is the same size. If they followed that principle in India, the whole pain of recalibration would have been avoided. And remember, that pain is not just continuing, it's likely to continue for another possible two weeks more, maybe even longer. No, no, uh, this is true. Uh, I'm not sure what you're recommending. I mean, ideally, we should move to having the same size for every note denomination. Uh, but the point is, since the ATMs had different sizes, what you're really saying is we should have had notes corresponding to these sizes. And this is not and a difficult thing for the government to have worked out before demonetizing, particularly if they claim they were working on demonetization and planning for it for 10 months. I mean, this is something they should have thought of, one would have said, at first hand, immediately. It's a very, it's a very good question, which, I mean, I'd like to get the answer to that too. Now, would you accept that the government, when it puts severe restrictions as it has, on the amount you can withdraw from ATMs, from savings and current accounts, or the amount that people can withdraw for their weddings, no matter what spin it puts on it, this is clear proof there is a shortage of cash in the economy, of actual notes and currency. No, that's quite clear. I mean, in the sense that, on the assumption that whatever you have in the bank account is actually uh, legitimate declared money, and if it's not, tax authorities know what's in bank accounts, I think people should be totally free to take out whatever they want from their bank account. The fact that we put restrictions simply means that there is a shortage of currency and they want to limit the extent to which uh, it's distributed around different people. So when government spokesmen, sometimes ministers, sometimes senior bureaucrats claim that this is actually being done, these restrictions are actually being placed to somehow curb black money, that is, forgive my colloquialism, baloney. 
I've not heard that particular explanation, but I wouldn't find that very convincing. I mean, let's be clear. Uh, when normalcy is returned, uh, is it the intention that when you've got your money in the bank, and the tax people know what there is in the banks, <clears throat> can you or can you not take it out in cash? Uh, the short answer should be yes, you should be able to. And if you can't, it's only because there's a shortage of cash. Probably true. Now finally, to come to the issue you raised a moment ago, district cooperative banks and rural cooperative banks. After initially giving them permission to either exchange or accept deposits of the old notes, within roughly 24 or 30 hours, the government removed that permission. Yet these banks cover rural India far more effectively and far more comprehensively than mainstream banks do. Apparently, there are 100,000 branches of cooperative banks in rural India handling a total of 10 lakh crore investments. Farmers, I'm told, mainly rely on mm. cooperative banks. So isn't this another error on the part of the government in implementation not to give these banks permission? Well, frankly, I don't understand the logic of that because, I mean, the whole idea uh, as part of a federal structure, the whole original idea was that cooperative banks will service agriculture and farmers and so on. They're regulated entities. They're covered by all sorts of regulatory structures. So frankly, whatever our banks can do, our cooperative banks can do also. If you don't have confidence in the management of the cooperative banks, those management should have been changed. And the corollary is if you deny those banks, those cooperative banks, permission to exchange and accept deposits of old notes, then you're leaving farmers who have only access to cooperative banks and don't have easy access to mainstream banks high and dry. No, well, that's, I mean, I, I personally feel that the, particularly since it's taking a lot of time, there's a very strong case for extending to cooperative banks the facility to accept old notes and issue new notes if there are enough new notes to issue. And if there aren't, then we better quick, as quickly as possible, ramp up the supply. So the decision the government took 24 hours after demonetization to deny cooperative banks that, that permission was wrong and they need to rescind it and revise it immediately. Well, I would certainly recommend that there's really no case uh, for, for not doing that. One other question about implementation. The 500 rupee note when it was legal tender, was used by chai walas, ready walas, vegetable vendors, and a whole range and series of artisans. It was a very common, convenient way in which people carried money. Secondly, it was also 48% of all currency. Mm -hmm. That being the case, should it have been demonetized at all? Because clearly it's no longer for people a high denomination note. No, that's a good point. I mean, if you wanted to narrow <coughs> the scope of, so to speak, the disruptive strike, uh, limiting the demonetization to 1,000 uh, would have kept a lot of people out of, out of the, uh, the danger. This is somewhere, again, the government should have thought carefully, and if it had, it would probably have decided not to demonetize the 500 for this reason. Well, I don't know what they would have decided, and I don't know what the pros and cons are. But they should have thought but carefully about it. to my mind, first of all, to my mind, uh, you don't, dis you don't demonetize 86% of the currency unless you can demonstrate that you can very quickly replace the currency. And that they can't because they have find it, it difficult. So in retrospect, it would have been better to demonetize half of it, which is the 1,000, and leave the 500 untouched. Now, one other matter to do with implementation, many may think it's a bit esoteric, it's to do with tourists. India has identified tourism as a critical industry that it believes can add to growth. It adds to employment. It's an area where large sums of FDI can come in. So it's critical for the government, and Mr. Modi has emphasized it repeatedly. Yet, when demonetization happened, there were thousands of tourists who had just cashed dollars and traveler's checks, stuck with the wrong notes, and then they spent days lining up in banks, frustrated, unable to see the country they'd come to see, and many thereafter threatening never to return. Do you think, given the critical importance of tourism, which Mr. Modi has himself emphasized, some sort of special facility should have been created to help them. Because otherwise this gives tourism in India a bad name for the future. Well, no, there's no question that uh, tourists were, you know, tourists in this sense become part of the informal sector because they are sort of mostly cash based, mostly. And they do get hurt. But, you know, I would say that uh, if everything else was fine and it was working well and some tourists got affected, uh, you wouldn't necessarily change the whole policy. 
I not change the policy. Not change the policy. Just open a facility for them. Yes, that I think, particularly in tourist centers, it would have been very thoughtful to do that. Particularly because you're looking to tourism as an engine for yeah. the economy yes, for the future. I, I, agree. I agree. One last question before I take a break. Does the fact that since demonetization on the eighth night and today, roughly in the last 14 days, the government has virtually every day had to change its rules and regulations about how much you can withdraw, where you can withdraw, who can withdraw. Does that constant changing of rules suggest that not enough care and attention went into the planning? Which is why now, every day they have to announce a new rule, a new change. Well, by the way, I, we should welcome this flexibility. Absolutely. I don't, I mean, I'm not I, criticizing I, it. Sometimes when you do something which you haven't fully thought out, it's better to say, well, look, we'll face the problems when they come up. I, so I, I give I, them I, credit. I'm not, I'm not criticizing the flexibility. Yeah. I'm saying something else. I'm saying, does the fact that every day you have to change the rules, every day you have to change the regulations, every day you have to come up with new relaxations, suggest that not enough careful thinking went in in the first place? I mean, I give them the benefit of the doubt because uh, I don't know how much thinking went in. And the truth is, no when one you, does. When no you, one yeah. does is the truth. Okay, but the thing is, when you do something so dramatic, new problems emerge. And actually, one thing you might do is, look, we'll change okay. uh, when it happens. So I'm focusing on, I'm happy that they're flexible. Yes, if they could have anticipated this. The problem really is on anticipation. It boils down to this. There are two strategic decisions that could have been considered other than the special facility. Which are, quickly? One is that you wait until you have enough of a supply and then do it. And the second is limit it to 1,000. Now, I do not know whether this was the experts in the finance ministry, RBI, put this before the government as options with the consequences, and then the government actually decided one way or the other. But those are the two most important thinking points. I think the third is really the cooperative banks. There, frankly, if the notes are not available, the denial of the facility to cooperative banks is simply another way of rationing notes. But the consequence of that is you're favoring urban areas against rural areas and because all the properties of these, are there. And all of these three points that you made are points that we discussed in this interview and we've gone through them comprehensively. Let's take a break at that point. I want to come back and raise the critical issues that I've left to the last on purpose. The raison d'etre for demonetization. Can it effectively tackle black money? Secondly, can it effectively tackle counterfeit currency? Because if the answer there raises question marks, then the whole raison d'etre of this exercise also has question marks around it. We'll be back in a moment's time for the last but critical part of this interview. Welcome back, you're watching To The Point and an exclusive interview with the former Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, Montek Singh Aluwalia, on demonetization. In part one, we talked about the impact demonetization can have on economic activity and GDP growth, as well as the key question, has it been thoughtfully or unthinkingly implemented? We now turn to what is perhaps the most important question of all, the raison d'etre for demonetization. Can it effectively control black money? Can it effectively control counterfeit currency? Mr. Aruwalia, let me put it like this. We now come to the question of how effective will demonetization be, even if for assumption's sake it is 100% successful. First, its intention is to extinguish black money. Pranab Sen, the former chief statistician, has said that only 6% of black money actually is held in cash. Former finance minister Chidambaram has said it's roughly 15%. My question is this, whether it's 6 or whether it's 15, even if all of this is extinguished, is the pain the economy has been put through, and perhaps casual labor in particular, worthy of that limited 6% or 15% gain? Or is this an instance where the gain does not justify the pain? 
Well, I think that's the right kind of calculation. And in fact, the government has itself said short-term pain for long-term gain. So obviously, to balance the two, somebody should weigh what is the short-term pain and what's the long-term gain. Now, we've discussed the short-term pain. I don't know what the government's own view on that is. So let's look at the long-term gain. One, my view is, by the way, on the counterfeiting... That's I'll come to that in a moment, sir. Oh, I Leave see. the counterfeiting, okay. stick to black money. 6% black or money, 15? I feel that, uh, in my view, uh, the f the too much of the discussion is focusing on black money, or rather that part of black wealth, which is held in cash. Now, Stock whether of it's, money. Yeah, whether it's held, whether it's 5%, 15%, those are relatively no numbers, low numbers. But see, the important thing is, what are people disgusted about? They're disgusted about a system where black money is being generated. You can't do your business without getting permissions, which you have to bribe people for. Unfair, overly connected people get a preference over you. They want to stop the generation of black money. That's very different from the stock of black money. So in my view, the more, I believe, by the way, that any identification of black, if you, the black economy phenomenon as a target is the correct, correct identification. But the most important thing is the generation, the flow of black That money. is not affected by these measures at all? Not at all. And what is more important, we can, there are many things we can do to address that issue. Let me put it at this and I'm interrupting you. And we you. should have done them. You're making a very important and a very critical distinction between the stock of black money and the generation of black money. Well, the stock of black money as a part of black wealth. Absolutely. And even if this government is successful in eliminating the stock of black money, we're only talking about, depending upon the various estimates, something between 6% at the low end and 15 at the high end. But the generation of black money, which is a much bigger problem, will continue because the incentives for people hiding their wealth and not paying tax on it continue as well. Yes. Until those incentives are removed, black money will continue being that, generated. That, to my mind, is the real war. That's where we should have had surgical But strikes. that's a war the government hasn't even undertaken to fight as yet. Well, you know, it's many... promised to do so in the future, yeah, but many, it hasn't happened. I mean, the Prime Minister has said more steps are coming, so I don't know what they are. Some people think the more steps relate to other parts of black wealth. Others say that, no, we're going to address the, the reasons why black money is created. If it's the latter, it's wonderful. And we should do that. But let me ask you, therefore, a critical question. Because at the moment, we're only talking about the fight on the stock of black money. And as I said, that figure varies between 6 and 16 and 15 percent of the total black wealth of the country. If that is all that is tackled by demonetization, is the pain worth the gain? Well, by the way, I'm not 100% sure how effectively even that's going to be tackled. Because let's, let's look so at... So even the gain that I'm talking about, a 6% may not be there, well, which means the pain is then totally not worth it. Um, let me explain what I had in mind, because it's a complex thing. You know, this cash, if somebody has black cash, on the 31st of December, this thing is going to be worthless, okay? So the incentive is going to be to launder it. Now, already, stories abound. People offering that, look, if you have this money, give it to me, and for a 20%, 30%, 40% cut, I'll just somehow launder it. Launder it means distribute it to a large number of people who will simply claim that this is legitimate income. And you're suggesting this could happen so comprehensively that it's difficult for the government to I'm, control and I'm check not, and stop. I'm certainly not suggesting that it'll happen, but I'm saying it's possible it's it will. Very likely. See, remember, if a person who holds black money will definitely take a, a, a discount to have it converted. I mean, after all, it's going to become what? worthless. 70% is better than losing it in the Exactly. Early. Now, the question is, can it be converted? You know, the real problem is that we have a very large number of people who depend in one way or the other on agriculture. Agricultural income is free of tax. So somebody who claims to be a farmer could legitimately go to a bank with a sack of money and say, you know, I've never trusted banks before. This is my past savings. I'm a farmer. There's no point in asking me about income tax because I'm free of income tax. What will you do? And because you haven't closed that conduit, this will become a means for laundering. It's pretty obvious. It's a pretty obvious means for laundering. And what is more, what this means, let me say, the guys who have this money are taking a loss. It's not as if they're getting away scot-free. 
But at the end of the day, you will not know how much has been laundered. See, the quite right, the, and therefore you won't know whether you've tackled the six or fifteen percent. Exactly, and therefore it's possible that even though six and fifteen percent are theoretically your target, and that's going to be the reason why you justify the pain. The pain may not achieve that target, and therefore the pain may not yes, be justified. Not only that, but we will actually end up underestimating. Because on the 31st of December, if holders of black money are rational, they won't be caught with this stuff at all. They'll Quite have changed right. it through some means. And then the banks will report that out of 5 lakh crores of currency, we got back almost the same month. And somebody will say, then there was no black money. That would be wrong. There is black money. It, I don't just, know got, what it, it is. just got laundered. It got laundered. Now, another point. L let me, the let me laundering is now taking place also through gold. Prices of gold have shot up. This will create an incentive to import gold. That will add to your import that will not, not, And it will put pressure on the rupee. So actually, I, I think, I mean, I'm assuming that both the finance ministry and the RBI are amply competent to have discussed these issues and put them before the government. Well, we hope so. And since we don't want to be disrespectful of our government and the intelligence within it, let's say they have been. But if they have been, they should share it with us. Let me come quickly, because we're running out of time, to the second raison d'etre for demonetization. The belief that it will effectively tackle counterfeit currency. Now, on Saturday, Defense Minister Parikar, I believe speaking in Goa, said that there were thousands of crores, I repeat that word, thousands of crores of counterfeit money that would be eliminated. But just last year, the National Investigation Agency, which is a government-controlled agency, did a survey which shows that at any one point of time, there is only 400 crore of counterfeit currency in circulation, and it increases by a fairly marginal 70 or 75 crore a year. So, if the National Investigation Agency figures are correct, and remember they are government figures, done by an agency that has expertise, then once again I ask the question, is the pain of demonetization the right way of tackling such a small sum of counterfeit money. Well, you know, I, I, my view on this, by the way, is that the introduction of new notes, which I'm told, I don't fully understand this, have very high security features, is definitely a good idea, and it will curb the existing, uh, you know, the tendency uh, of people to counterfeit and make it more difficult. That part is good. I'm not sure that you would demonetize 86% of the outstanding currency in order to catch hold of counterfeit money. Particularly if it's only 400 crore. Yeah, so the, to be fair, they've mentioned that, but the, the principal target was uh, the belief somehow, but in, in Hindi it's called Kala Dhan. Now Kala Dhan doesn't mean Kala money, it means black wealth. Actually it will target the cash component of black wealth. And the wealth is beyond your Subject, reach. No, it's not beyond your reach, but are you planning now mm another set of things but, but altogether. It's beyond the reach of demonetization. Yes, it's beyond the reach of And now, as you said, even the black wealth held in cash can slip out of your control to the extent to which it is laundered in the ways you described a moment ago. Exactly. Which means, both in terms of the targeting of counterfeit currency and in terms of the targeting of the black wealth held in cash, the pain will not be justified by the gain. The pain may be greater than the gain, and people may end up saying, was it worth the trauma you put us through? That's a legitimate question that could, I'm not saying it will, that could arise. If, if the other steps that I've mentioned on tackling black money are taken, then the package as a whole may look quite good. The government does, to be honest, promise to take them. The Prime Minister has spoken about them. He's identified Benami property in particular. That's not what I have in mind. Benami property is still dealing with the existing stock. You're talking about... Disincentivizing yes. the cre generation Several of black money. Several economists, Vijay Kelka, Ajay Shah, others have written. V very, very quickly, because we're running out of time, what are the steps that you think need to be taken to tackle the generation of black money? But literally, very quickly. Well, number one, you want to be much more transparent on big financial transactions. Number two. Number two, you need to m massively modernize both your tax system lowering tax rates and your system of tax administration. Number three. There are many recommendations of the Patrasati Shom Committee that are waiting decision making. Land is the biggest problem. Now fortunately spectrum and minerals are now auctioned. But land is, is a non-transparent natural resource. Is that a fault? Well, I would say lowering the stamp duty on land is a clear one. Uh, what about, what about bringing the farm sector into taxation so that it can't be used as a conduit for laundering as you mentioned? You know, let me say the farm sector 
under the Constitution, it is not outside taxation. It is in the purview of the state governments. But it's not taxed. Well, that's up to state government. But do you think it should be taxed as a way of disincentivizing I don't mind. Generation? I don't mind the situation where state governments make that decision. After all, we are a federal country. So you're leaving it to state governments. To yes, do. but the only thing I, is that I'm running a out state of government that can get a lot of money this way shouldn't be able to get central government money on the grounds that it doesn't have resources. My that's last question. Way. There is a danger today because parliament has been paralyzed for four or five days and it looks to many as if it continues to be paralyzed for a further period of days. But in fact, the GST bills, which are the critical legislative business of this House, will not get passed. And if they don't get passed, the April 1st deadline for the rollout of GST will also be missed. Now, if that happens, how worried would you be? Well, it'll be, it will be unfortunate. Uh, if it's simply delayed a little bit, that's a different thing. You know, my own view on this is that what has emerged from the consultation with the states is a pretty messy GST. And I mean, with too many rates, and it's not consistent with the GST that will cut out cor corruption, cut out uh, misdeclarations, and so on. But it would be unfortunate. I mean, I think that but was a major... But you're almost suggesting that if because of paralysis in Parliament the GST bills aren't passed and the deadline is missed, it might be, I'm emphasizing the word might, it might be a sort of blessing in disguise because you can then revisit GST and come well, up with a Well, I don't know one. whether they would revisit, but I'm certainly saying that if there was a way of delaying GST by six months and collapsing it into two rates, that would be terrific. But uh, to be honest, no political party or any state is in favor of it. Absolutely. In fact, the states have made but, the situation worse. But if a delay leads to a better GST, you would welcome it. You wouldn't mourn it and regret it. I would do that, yes. Montego Aluwalia, a pleasure talking to you. Nice talking to you, Karan.